Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's just gone 4 p.m. No, sorry, 3 p.m. in South Africa, and it's time for this week's webinar. It's really exciting to be with you. Uh, I've said it's 3 p.m. in South Africa, but I know we have got many guests from other parts of the world. So welcome to this webinar on Abalone. It's the first in a series of three webinars. This one dealing with abalone. Next week, we'll be discussing mussels and uh, the week after that, oysters. I'm really excited to, to bring you this from where I'm coming from, uh, which is Aquaculture Africa magazine, soon to be known as uh, Aquaculture Africa Media. Um, but this webinar has been made possible primarily by Trade Ford Southern Africa. Uh, they've done some work in supporting uh, the shellfish sector in South Africa and in Namibia, and uh, they have made this webinar this afternoon possible. I can see the room is still filling up. Uh, we've had well over 700 people register for this webinar. A very high percentage of those 700 will watch the recording afterwards. We've got about, I think, about 130 or so in the room at the moment. And uh, we're ready to get rolling with a very full program this afternoon. As I said, this is webinar one. I will share some details about the other webinars as we go through this afternoon's program. Just some basics. Many of you know exactly how webinars work, but uh, please use the chat panel to say hi. Um, it's always nice to see who's online, who's chatting, uh, there's often, if you want to share your, your email address on the chat, you're welcome. I can see there are people joining us from the Seychelles and from Egypt and from several other countries. Welcome to all of you. I can see Nigeria, Somalia, Zambia, uh, Sudan. Um, if I run through here quickly, uh, let's have a look. Uh, not quite sure. It's uh, really a wide variety of, of guests, uh, obviously many people from South Africa, but please say hi to us. Um, I see Michael has just linked in from Vietnam, uh, Jonathan from Ghana, and uh, Dr. Ahmed, my old friend from Egypt, welcome to all of you this afternoon. So say hi on the chat panel, it's great to hear from you. Use the question and answer panel for your questions. We'll take uh, a discussion at the end of the webinar and we'll try and answer as many as your, of your questions as we possibly can. Um, park your questions in the Q&A because it's easier for us to find them there as opposed to looking for them in the, uh, in the chat panel. This webinar is recorded. Many people will watch the recording afterwards. You will also get the link to the recording in your email tomorrow together with a link to the presentation slides. Um, I can also tell you that at the end of this webinar, we'll share the email addresses of the speakers. And the only other thing that I've got to say is for you to sit back, relax, and learn about this really interesting sector uh, within the greater framework of aquaculture in South Africa. As I've already said, we've got three webinars. Today's one is on abalone. On the 16th of February, we'll cover mussels. And on the 23rd of February, we'll be talking about oysters. I will give you those details to register for those respective webinars uh, as we go through the program. If we have a look at our program today, it's really full. I actually want to uh, get on with uh, the work that's ahead. Um, I'm going to step off with this introduction quite soon, and then I'll hand over to Mr. Sim Duby from Trade Forward Southern Africa. I will then hand over to Andrea Benetzida, who is the Director of Aquaculture Research and Development at the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. We'll have a short video clip on Abalone. Then we'll be joined by Sarah Hulse from Abergold. She's going to give us an overview of South African Abalone of the sector. We will have an input by Tian Prim, who's uh, the Chair of the Abalone Export Council. I will do a short, short presentation of on the work from TFSA, and then I'll ask Johan Hackrut uh, to give us his input from the Abalone Farmers Association of South Africa. As I said, a very full program, so I want to get moving. 
on that note, I want to go straight over to Sim Dube. Sim is from Trade for Southern Africa. And as I said at the start, they have made uh, this webinar series possible. Sim, are you able to open your camera and uh, give us your opening remarks? Thank you, Sim. Thank, thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, for some reason, I cannot get my video playing, but I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, we'll have a look into that problem on our side as well, but please uh, continue. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Etienne. I think for us really is uh, trade for Southern Africa, this is an honor to actually be in, uh, in amongst uh, experts in this sector. Um, I think we really have to show that appreciation and enjoy this topic today. So from my side, really, I will not take too much time for in terms of because there's get experts here, we're going to be talking about this subject. I just want to talk about the project uh, trade for Southern Africa, who we are, what we aim to do and how we collaborate with yourselves. So we are a three-year project, uh, which is funded by the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, popularly known as FCDO. And really we work in the six Southern African countries, for want of a better word, it's actually the SACO countries, including Mozambique. Um, how, how is it that we get involved with, with uh, sectors like yourselves? The program aims to give capacity building and technical assistance to help grow trade and find targeted solutions to improve especially gender quality, we're very strong on that. And we really want to alleviate poverty across the SACU plus M uh, region, which I've just mentioned. So our key uh, uh, objectives or key uh, intervention areas are around uh, information and trade promotion. We do offer our uh, online training uh, under our School of Export, where we actually, uh, our partners can have access to actually access our modules as across about 21 modules that we have at the moment on anything on exporting and also have an LMS system as well there that's really, it's actually an LMS system, learner management system that we have there free of charge. That's what we offer to our partners. Uh, we also do a lot of work around value chains. We've really taken time to identify the value chains that we work in. And uh, I, I, as you know, aquaculture is clearly one of the value chains. And we also work under trade and customs, uh, customs training to ensure that our exporters are quite clear in terms of what they need to do to export. And we are very deliberate and very strong working around women in trade. So we support women across the region to help them also be part of the mainstream economy. So that's the work that we're doing. And today, uh, as we all know, we're actually working with uh, the value chain that we've selected, which is aquaculture. And just looking at the attendance uh, in, this, in this webinar, it's pretty obvious why aquaculture is a, 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 a sector to support. We're quite aware that it's one of the fastest growing uh, food sectors globally and is considered a key sector for future food production. So it makes sense that we support this. And we know that if farmed responsibly, aquaculture bears huge promises. So we, we really see the re reason to support this kind of work. So we have worked with our partners, we call them business support organizations under aquaculture to actually ensure that we, we give this necessary support where possible to promote these exports. And we've actually collaborated with our, one of our partners in updating the South African roadmap to EU compliance to the South African aquaculture sector. So this uh, session, this work workshop really amongst experts is a discussion around this, especially with, our, with Abalone in mind. And we really want to make sure that we can access as much as, po as, much as possible for our partners can access export markets. We as TFSA are actually here to, to support that work. And we're pretty happy to have you here and talking to us. I think maybe I'll just leave all the time to other experts to talk. Thank you, Essen. Great. Tim, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Um, I think our challenge with cameras have been sorted out and we, we're going to have to show people what you look like. Uh, so, um, Tim, if you can open your camera, then, uh, then at least I, 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 I can proudly say that uh, we, we all know what you look like and we all can uh, look forward to seeing you. When we see you again, we, at least we can recognize you. Sim, so thanks, thanks for that. Absolutely. I hope you can see me now. I've really, I think technology has been sorted out, so I hope you can see me. If not, I'll be Yes. Try. Yes, great. So, um, it, would be, it would be a pity if, if you did all of that makeup beforehand, just uh, for us not to be able to open up the camera. Great. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Great. Great. So, thank you very much for those words. I think some people that are listening online will be excited by the work that TFSA are doing. And I want to invite everybody to have a look at those free training tools around export and the free um, lectures and courses that are provided by TFSA. 
uh, it's certainly worth, whether you're in aquaculture or any other commodity, it's certainly worth looking at. Right, on with our program. Um, none of this sector would be possible without the hard work of government. Um, a lot of my friends and colleagues work in the South African government department responsible for aquaculture. And sometimes they get the raw end of the deal because we all blame them. But uh, essentially, this sector would not be where it is without people like Andrea Bernadzida, who is the director of aquaculture research. Um, Andrea, you can unmute. Uh, you're welcome to share screen and uh, please give us your opening remarks. Okay, thanks, Etienne. Uh, just checking that you can see my screen. Yes, 100%. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Etienne. Um, good afternoon. Uh, three o'clock on our side. Etienne hasn't stolen an hour from us here. Um, to the panelists and participants that have joined this discussion. Uh, I think safe to say the work that I'm presenting is really a team effort uh, from within our department and um, other competent res uh, authorities responsible for aquaculture in South Africa. I just wanted to flag a few things before we go into the video. So uh, a couple of things is that we've obviously identified aquaculture as an important sector for growth. Uh, one, in terms of creating sustainable job opportunities, I think, as Sim said, especially in terms of women and youth employment, economic development, uh, it's around abalone specifically is uh, capitalizing on export opportunities, stimulating rural development and livelihoods. A lot of the abalone farms are very close to the coastal environment, uh, attracting foreign direct investment. A key part being Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment is also ensuring a sustainable sector um, and creating opportunities for SMMEs in the aquaculture sector. So that's broadly why and the priority around growing the aquaculture sector. Then just to flag a few initiatives, um, there's obviously a broad range of initiatives, but that relate to the diversification and growth um, of the aquaculture sector in terms of market. Um, we've developed a South African aquaculture certification framework uh, to guide our initiatives around the four pillars, um, food safety, aquatic animal health, environment, um, animal welfare, socioeconomics, uh, in line with international standards. Um, we also update and implement the food safety mo monitoring programs, especially for invertebrates in line with local and relevant international standards and in collaboration with various competent authorities. Uh, the work that is being discussed at this webinar is really in line with that. And we take uh, very important research that has been done in this regard and then incorporated it into our food safety monitoring programs. Uh, we've also developed a public awareness and marketing strategy for aquaculture products in the sector. And specifically around abalone, we've looked at simplifying the sale of farmed abalone in the local market in order to diversify the market. And then from my directorate, we do continuous research on improving existing farming technology and sustainability in collaboration with industry. It's a fantastic relationship. And, and this currently includes a strong focus towards integrated multi-trophic aquaculture systems, but all of that has to be in line with biosecurity and food safety, so they're all interlinked. So some of the things around activities that have been done around the public awareness and marketing strategy, uh, for the local market, we've developed various um, recipe books to help educate the public around what they can do with our aquaculture products and also seafood in general. Uh, there's an aquaculture value chain proposition. And then um, what we'll be looking at now is we've developed six videos uh, for the primary species that are farmed, including abalone. The one video Etin will show now. Uh, we've also done in-flight campaigns um, and airlines and magazines, and we continuously do social media campaigns uh, within our own social media pages from DFFE. Thank you. I'm keeping it short so that you can look at the visual prep, uh, representation in the video. Thank you, Etienne. 
Great. Thank you, Andrea. Always nice to have your input. Um, I am going to call up the video clip onto the screen. Um, if you are having any bandwidth uh, challenges with watching the video clip, we will put the video clip link uh, into your email tomorrow. So if it's difficult to follow the video, please bear with us. Uh, some people with limited bandwidth might struggle, but uh, I will certainly share, share that clip with you. Um, lots of comments coming through on the chat panel. Uh, Henrik from Mozambique, Melinda, Angola. I wish I could greet everybody. We've got people as far away as Jamaica. Leanne, uh, really welcome. Nice to have you uh, join us as well. We've got well over 200 people in the room and uh, a full session this afternoon. I'm going to try and share the video clip. Please enjoy it for a few minutes. It's a really interesting insight into Abalone. very blessed to farm a very unique species, uh, one of the top species of abalone in the world and highly regarded for its quality. My name is Jacques Duplessis. I've been in the South African abalone farming industry for the last 20 years. South African abalone farming industry farms with a very unique species called Haliotis midday. What makes our product unique is that it's fed by the pristine waters from this beautiful coastline. Our abalone is farmed um, through all the life stages, we have a collection of broodstock, which we condition um, on a regular basis to produce eggs and larvae and take them through all the, the life stages and take them through the production system until they reach a size that could be marketed. Farming abalone is not only keeping them alive in the tanks, it's actually making them to grow. And then all that intrinsic factors like the age, the weight, the species and all that stuff is to be taken into account when you measure the uh, aquaculture species. In South Africa, we farm abalone on land with pump ashore systems. So we pump water from the sea into our abalone tanks and it flows back to the sea. We do work on a, quite a lot of things to make this, this better. We work on renewable energy. We work on always trying to, to make our footprint smaller. We, um, we feed natural seaweeds to our, to our abalone together with their feed. So to make sure that our um, product is safe to eat, we have a HACCP system in place, which is a food safety program. We got audited every year, twice a year, by the NRCS from the government to make sure that we do stick to the rules and regulations. We also do internal auditing. And we also have a HACCP external company that has come every year, once a year, to do an annual auditing, also to make sure that we do stick to the rules and regulations from the government side. Sustainability is very, very important to us. Um, we need to think about the future. We need to think about the future of this farm, about the people that work here, their families, their kids growing up. So whatever we do, we do it for a, a stable future going forward. A lot of people that started working at Aquan and Uman's Bay didn't have any experience at all. That is why the management staff of Aquan make sure to give training to those people. And Jacob's Bay Sea Products is actually a well-known employer amongst the people in Saldana Bay. There's current stream of CVs coming in for people that actually want to be employed here because 100% of all our workers that comes in here becomes permanent employees. South African abalone is one of the most valuable species of abalone in the world. And it's very recognizable because of its light white shell, and often referred to by the Chinese as the blonde abalone. It's also recognizable because of the beautiful frills that uh, is abundant in the abalone. And it's got a very good shell to meat ratio.
Great. I'm sure many of you that are online, uh, excuse me for the background sound. We just need to stop that. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm sure that many of you that are online uh, have not eaten abalone before. And I'm hoping that that little video clip uh, actually gets you curious enough to, to go out and, and try abalone. Um, I've tried it. I've loved it. I don't eat enough of it. Um, but certainly that little video clip, I'm sure, is going to spark a lot of interest. Uh, we've heard some basics on, on abalone, but now we need to get into the more advanced information. Um, we are joined today by Sarah Hulse from Abigail. She is the Research and Sustainability Manager at Abigail. I had to beg, borrow and steal uh, her time. She's a very busy person, but uh, she knows a lot more about abalone than I do. And Sarah, it's an honor for us to have you online with us. I know you've worked really hard on this presentation. You can go ahead, share your screen and take us through your material. Thank you. Thanks, Etienne. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, there we go, Sarah. We can see your screen. You can just go into presentation mode. Perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, so the Haliotis midi, the South African abalone. Um, I think first things first, if you didn't see it um, from that awesome video, what is an abalone? Um, it's not a fish. Um, so abalone are marine mollusks or snails, and there's about 56 species of abalone around the world. Um, but only about 10 to 14 of those species actually um, support commercial fisheries. And the main harvesting areas for, for those wild fisheries have been Australia, Japan, New Zealand, South Africa, Mexico, and the United States. Um, so in South Africa, we have about five species, but only Haliotis midi, which is what you see there on, on my left, um, is harvested commercially. So known locally as the Perlamon, um, Haliotis midi is endemic to South Africa. Um, yeah, and it occurs in the intertidal zone of the Western and Southern Cape Oceans. So abalone, just like your typical garden snail, will use their foot to crawl along, um, which you can see over there, uh, and they'll crawl from place to place. Uh, they have characteristic holes along the circumference of one side of their shell, which is used for excreting waste, um, excretion of waste, uh, breathing, and for reproduction. Uh, they're naturally herbivorous animals, and they use a, their rasp mouth to catch, touch, and feed on seaweeds. And they have a very simple eye structure, which allows them to separate, separate between light and dark. South African abalone, as, as Jacques mentioned in the video, um, are characteristically white, and they have these wave-like ridges, uh, which you can see here on the image. Uh, historically, there's been serial declines in, in wild abalone stocks um, across the world and, and all major supply countries, and this is due to overexploitation. And South Africa, unfortunately, is no exception to that. However, despite the decline and abundance of abalone worldwide, the supply now exceeds the PK day levels that uh, were, were observed in the 1970s, and this is in part due to the successful production of legal farmed abalone. The commercial wild abalone fishery began in 1945 in an open access fishery in the Western Cape of South Africa. However, unregulated fishing and unsustainable harvesting led to a decline in wild stocks, and this resulted in quota restrictions being implemented. At the end of apartheid, we saw a politically complex reform process, uh, which reallocated rights, and the wild fishery saw increasing regulation, declining stocks, and increase in illegal catch which led to the suspension of the wild fishery in 2003. In the early 90s, the, 90s, the demand for South African abalone grew and prices increased radically and opportunities for trade opened. So whilst the illegal fishery grew, it also spurred the commercialization of abalone aquaculture and the industry developed itself off the curtails of wild abalone stocks depleting and were able to provide a sustainable solution to a growing demand. So while that was all happening, research on production had begun in about the late 1980s with pre-commercialization trials. Often these were run in the garages of homes to trial and error and trial and error again, but ultimately this ignited the industry. And so 
with the growing research, so grew the need for commercialization of the abalone farms. And here you can see some of the image of, of the, the starting days of, of Abagolf, which was known as Hamant's abalone then. Uh, the early days of farming saw that the small animals from the farms were very different, often about 10 times smaller from the wild that were dominating the market at the time, and this limited opportunity. However, production methods evolved and opportunities grew. Um, unfortunately, the abalone is a species that can be very successfully farmed. So why abalone? Um, I think there are a few people convinced about why abalone from, from looking at the, the video there with the recipes. Um, but yeah, as with any other abalone species worldwide, South African abalone are sought out delicacy uh, in the East and Southeast Asia, as well as in Latin America and France and of, a high, val of high value. So abalone is praised for its uh, delicate and mommy flavor. There's also significant cultural importance associated with the animal. It's known to be an elixir of life. It's a symbol of abundance for a new year. And it's often a celebratory food. It's a, known as a strengthening food. And it's in fact, customary to give abalone to your mother-in-law. So chefs and restaurants in Hong Kong introduced the South African abalone to consumers. And this gained more and more popularity. It triggered Australia, Korea, China to the opportunity and so they began their own abalone agriculture ventures. However, arguably, South Africa was the pioneer of bringing farmed abalone to the market. The South African abalone is a highly regarded low impact species. And whilst we are relatively small, we have quite an established and collaborative industry uh, with lots of room for growth, uh, coupled with a significant amount of history and a lot of institutional knowledge. We are significant employers in our communities, as you also saw in the video, um, and yeah, we have a lot of room for upskilling our employees and we're fortunate to have incredible access to, to wonderful natural, natural waters and environment. So whilst I don't work in production, I'm going to talk a little bit about production. Um, so commercializing abalone as a farm product is, is quite complex, particularly when one needs to produce with intact margins, as has been the case in the last few years. Abalone farming is very intensive, it's expensive, and it's very slow with abalone taking anything from three to five years to reach market size. So in a commercial hatchery, we artificially recreate spawning events through priming broodstock to reach their temperature hours, and we artificially induce spawning. So there's a number of different ways to do this, one being uh, pH changes through chemical intervention, or the use of ultraviolet uh, radiated water. And male and female, ab female abalones can be told apart by their gonads. Uh, so the male have these cream colored gonads while the females have this greeny blue gonad. We keep the males and the females separate in tanks um, and then they spawn and the eggs and the sperm are released through the uh, breeding holes along, along the, the, the circumference of the shell and the eggs are siphoned and the sperm's collected and these are manually fertilized. After fertilization, abalone are going to go through a whole bunch of different developmental stage. And at the juvenile stage, South African abalone start looking for areas where they can settle and be safe. In the commercial hatchery, this will be on settlement tanks, um, which are coated with diatoms, as you can see here, to act as an environmental cue for settlement and to provide food. Settle abalone will stay on these racks until they're big enough to be deflated, um, which is a fancy word for being removed. And then they moved into the nursery. And here they are kept under cones and they begin this transition uh, from this diatom diet to a predominantly formulated feed or seaweed diet. Uh, when the animals grow out, they are now called spat. Um, and they, they now have reached size. And this can be anything from about six to nine months. And then they moved on to the farm for grass. So grass in theory is a, a bit of a simpler process than the hatchery. Uh, there's probably some grass managers out there who are not very happy with me saying that. Um, abalone are maintained in, in land-based tanks with a flow-through system. We have to maintain appropriate stocking densities, make sure we feed appropriately, and ensure there's a, a clean environment. Um, Again, it's a heavily and intensive process. Um, so just looking at food very quickly, um, 
So a lot of research has gone into the development of different formulated diets. The industry currently has two local feed manufacturers and feed strategies differ between different operations and the different life stages. And farms will um, use either seaweeds or formulated feeds or a mix of both. And they kind of alternate between that uh, through the life cycle. So I spoke to stocking density earlier. So um, some people call it gradient, some people call it sorting, but abalone are size sorted on about a four to eight month cycle, depending on your operation. And this helps maintain that stock, stocking density in the basket. Um, so that's favorable for growth and maintains a good, good animal welfare practices. So the environment uh, is critical for us. So abalone farms operate 24 hours a day, pumps need to pump and blowers need to blow. Um, air in an abalone tank is, um, is integral. It's not there as a source of oxygen. That's what the fresh water is there for, but rather it's for flow. And when I say fresh water, I mean fresh ocean, ocean water. Um, most South African farms are land-based um, abalone farms and they use a flow-through system. So they have tanks on land, as you can see here in this image. Um, being pumped on shore to, to fill these. Um, tanks are filled with baskets and that allows for easy handling and easy management. Um, it is quite a labor intensive process as the tanks do need to be cleaned frequently and this helps maintain growth quality again. Um, so here you can see uh, tank cleaning going on. So regardless of methods, all abalone farms are exposed to environmental challenges. Um, these include sea temperature fluctuations, uh, algal blooms or red tides, storms, seasonal variations, just to name a few. And uh, all of these are, are big impacts on our growth and quality. So they're very carefully monitored. Impressively though, the industry has rallied with some, some wonderfully innovative approaches to most, most problems. And as such, research has continued and critical to our sustainability. Um, so yeah, just in closing, um, just a quick Google search shows that there's still a lot to explore with the species um, compared to some of the other abalone species. Uh, this was just looking at, at hits of journals and, and articles on Heliotis um, you know, There's still a lot of research that can be done. Um, and the, however, abalone doesn't always, uh, it's, it's got its limitations. It's a, because it's such a slow growing species, we can only measure size. Um, once they get sorted, uh, so it's difficult to get enough info quickly enough um, for a lot of research projects and a lot of researchers. But there's um, certainly lots of opportunity. Um, Andrea spoke to market access being one of those increasing, improving and developing our markets, product development, consumer awareness, expanding our methods, um, such as abalone ranching, that's when abalone are, are put out uh, into, into the ocean once they've reached a certain size and then harvested later on, um, undertaking innovations to improve productivity and reduce our costs, uh, greening the industry, so embracing traceability, sustainability, certification, and mitigating and tackling environmental and social risks um, associated with, with changes and climate change, as an example, and other sustainability, sustainability concerns. Yeah, so that's me, um, and I hope that gave you a good overview of, of Abilene. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, before I let you go, uh, did you ever think that you would be working in Abilene research when you grew up? No, I was going to go save the dolphins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually right. I always said that. I'll never get into agriculture and um, I did and I'm absolutely loving it so great great Sarah thank you very much for that uh, interesting presentation on the production side of things um, Sarah I'm sure there are going to be questions coming through so we're going to carry on with uh, with the rest of our talks and then anybody that does want to ask a question of Sarah on what she's presented Please put it in the Q&A panel. Uh, we'll see those questions and we'll try and come back to them. I see there have been several people asking for contact details. We will share contact details at the end of the webinar. Um, I see there's some very interesting discussions around, uh, I think it's uh, Khalid saying, please come and farm in the Red Sea uh, in the Sudan, uh, asking for partnership 
with people to uh, to set up there. You can pick that up in the chat panel. So a lot of interesting discussion taking place. Uh, the key question, however, is when we've grown these abalone, can we can we actually sell them? Um, so aquaculture is nothing if we can't move the product. And uh, to give us a little bit of insight around uh, around the markets and marketing of abalone, we are honoured to have Tian Prim, who is the chair of the Abalone Export Council, with us. I see Tian has already shared his screen. So Tian, welcome and thank you for your time. I'm going to give the floor over to you. Thanks, Tian. Thank you, Etienne, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, it's great to be with you. Uh, thank you to South Africa and uh, Aqua uh, Africa magazine for making this possible. So, yeah, great to be with you. Um, just, just a quick overview of the South African um, or, or background on South African Abalone Export Council. Uh, it's a non-profit organization. Uh, it's member-funded. Uh, most of the abalone farms and producers belong to the uh, South African Abalone Export Council. Uh, it is obviously voluntary if you want to join or not. Uh, it's self-funded. And then we also get some, uh, our funding is matched by the DTI, uh, a government uh, trade organization in South Africa. Uh, you know, whatever we fund, they they fund uh, uh, times two. So, so uh, you know, I've I've relatively new to the industry, um, but you know, as as you've seen, uh, you know, fantastic uh, what has happened in the past 20, 25 years here, and um, you know, uh, uh, and as we go through the market, you know, uh, I hope you also realize, you know, what what impact South African Avalon has had. As Sarah rightly said, you know, as farmed abalone uh, across the world. So my presentation is basically in in three parts. You know, to understand the market, um, the global market is basically the first point. To to uh, the mention is many uh, Japan, uh, China. Um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the Mexicans, uh, 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 the Americans, uh, so, so a lot of producers. So that's the first bit. The second bit of my presentation, I would just like to talk about, you know, uh, what, what, you know, where does South African Avalon go in the world? And then thirdly, why South African Avalon? And I think Jacques from the video and Sarah touched on some of those points, you know, you know the provenance of our, of our product, uh, what a good product we have and uh, how it's appreciated in, in, in the market. So let's get going. A um, lot of information here on this slide, but you know, context is that you know, the global uh, ranking of who's the importer. So the, the source of this data is from the WITS Worldwide Integrated Trade Solution. So they measure uh, how uh, Avalon cross borders. So very importantly, uh, this stats here shows obviously not local consumption of, of, of Avalon because that doesn't cross a border logically. Um, so you can see if we take the, the whole Avalon market, you know, uh, not this is not just South Africa, but the whole worldwide Avalon market. Hong Kong is our biggest market. Uh, this, this data is still to update until 2021. And um, you know, 2022 is not out, and you can still see there's still miss, missing data from 2021, the yellow blocks. But but you know, in summary of this, I'm not going to read verbatim. You know, each, each and every my comments there at the top. Uh, Hong Kong is is a big uh, uh, let's say consumer of uh, import and obviously consumer of Avalon, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, China. Um, Remember, this is what gets into the China. China's got a massive local market that's obviously not reported in the uh, numbers. United States is important. South Korea, Macau, you know, basically part of, of China, Canada, so the North Americas. And, and then there's Bulgaria, very interestingly, not part of the EU, EU and then Italy and, and Spain, you know, uh, you know uh, is also importers of Avalon. You can see that in 2020, specifically 2021, you know, some of these countries have taken a bit of a dip, you know, and let's put it down to the COVID size. But 
in general, this gives us an overview of of um, where the amyloid goes and crosses borders in the world. Uh, just for clarity, that sales weight and harvest weight, um, you know, we sell products to be much less, but, uh, you know, that gives us a, a good understanding uh, where, where does what goes. So, lots of data here. The data, you know, paints a picture. There's obviously lots of data behind this as well, but, you know, um, this analyzes the country of origin. For each format of Avalon, you know, again, only up to 2021, um, we can see that, that that China and Australia are the primary origins of frozen Avalon, so very big in frozen Avalon, the Chileans uh, as well, the top three, then live Avalon, yes, where South Africa is starting to feature, um, uh, Korea is the biggest, predominantly all Korea. Korea, South Korea, Avalon goes to, to Japan. It's just across the channel. Uh, but South Africa, it was quite big, uh, 1,000 tons plus in 2021 already. Then the Australians are quite big in the live uh, Avalon. And then the Chinese also export a lot of live Avalon. And then dried Avalon, uh, top three countries uh, 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 that export. So again, the Chinese, they, they products South Africa, very big in the dried Avalon. Um, Zambia. And, uh, and that's the sticky one. That's the the illicit abalone that travels through that route. And then on, out of Hong Kong, once it's imported, you know, uh, you know, it's Hong Kong is used as a base to export it then to different as a free trade uh, area, then to mostly America or Canada. Then uh, canned, you know, completely dominated by by Chinese canned. Um, uh, uh, Taiwan as well, and Australia is quite big in the uh, in New Zealand and South Africa. You know, very similar. So, so the message for the information from this, you know, shows us that 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 South Africa is a large player in our species is a large large player in um, the live product and the dried product specifically, um, and this is all Madea. They are the, our species, so so quite 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 a good presence in the the dried uh, market as well. All right, so the second part of my pre presentation. So country of origin, South Africa. So so who imports our product? Yeah, you know, where does it, this wonderful product of us go? And um, we can again, uh, you know, make four, uh, you know, products. You know, canned, dried, live, and frozen. And our cat product uh, into Hong Kong. Uh, three, uh, our dried product, definitely Hong Kong. Um, then our live product, also Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and China. That's top three markets where South African Avalon goes into the, the, the live Avalon and then frozen, not, not very big, uh, into Hong Kong and China. You can see that we've added on the VITS, VITS data, we've analyzed the pricing. You can see uh, the massive effect, effect that uh, COVID had, for instance, on canned pricing um, in 20 and 2021. 20, you know, the pricing halved. Uh, you, you saw the reduction in pricing year as well from 30 to 26 in the live. Uh, but very interestingly, uh, what happened in the dried market as routes were closed because of COVID more of the, the the farmed avalanche which is higher prices entered into the market since 2021 and you can see the delta uh, between that that prices and even into china all right so now we know where our, our products are going to what are major markets uh, what what's the products uh, where they go then I think Sarah spoke to this already. Um, you know, uh, why is Avalon firstly important to the Chinese, Cantonese, and for other developing, uh, uh, um, you know, pellets uh, in, in the East? Why is it important? You know, it's part of uh, the, the four traditional high end ingredients, treasures of the seas for Chinese diet uh, Avalon, sea cucumber, shark fin, and fish maw uh, is the four of them. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a product uh, through our market research that we do 
Uh, it's a product that's not easy to replaceable. It's a very, you know, from, from the comments we get uh, through uh, studies that we do through, through Nielsen's or, or reputable uh, consultants uh, in our markets. Um, you know, so it's a very special product. Uh, again, as Sarah said, families, that's why I put up the picture there, you know, it's part of their celebration. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, it's good to know that uh, your product is not easily re replaceable. But I also get to, you know, how things are evolving and uh, where the risk and opportunities are in, in our products. Okay. Then if we look at the provenance of uh, South African Avalon in market studies that we've done, say, of our dry product in mainland China, uh, this is the immediate feedback that we get. You know, it's important for our customers to know where our product is coming from. South African, Australian, Jap Japanese, and Middle East dried product is, is very prevalent. Um, you know, important, good quality in mainland China specifically. And then the live product here, uh, you know, they use their own product, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. And this tells us also that there's a massive opportunity for the South African uh, uh, producers to get into the live market because we've got such a good product. So, so we, I think we're understanding our market much better, and uh, you know, continued research, you know, leads us to to um, you know do things better as well. All right, and then the typical supply chain. Uh, if we take uh, into our main markets, Hong Kong and 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 China, you know. Uh, basically family driven you know the, the, the consumer driven there's a local retailer or restaurant hotels wholesaler uh these large distributors uh that sits in mainland china or in hong kong or or just in hong kong and then you know the demand for, flows through important po point here is that um there's a lot of market education that's still to be done to be done uh to make it more of um you know, to build brands and and to end the South African brand uh, as a preference, uh, you know, to boost demand. Where you know, I think traditionally we're still in that curve of 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 where where it's more more of a pull as uh, as, as as a push from from the industry. All right, um, I've just you know the presentation will be shared. And for those people that want to read the details and the comments of people that we interviewed and whatever, you know, but impo important, yeah, is the dry product, you know, is still, still up there. The issue with the uh, with quality, um, the issue with the dry product is that there's a possibility of the skill gets lost how to prepare it. It's quite a difficult, uh, not difficult, but it's a long time to process it. To get it onto a plate from the dried format, being you know, with broths and rehydrating. Uh, the live abalone remains very popular, and then the canned abalone, you're ready to eat, but it also has, you know, in China specifically, a perception of being a cheap product. So, so new product development, again, as Sarah said, you know, we need to take that on board, ready to eat um, uh, products, uh, is, you know, for the faster pace uh, uh, living. Um, but yeah, in all, I think we've got a fantastic product. Uh, I think we've got a fantastic product mix um, uh, that has different characteristics and has a different uh, benefit through different cycles, economic cycles. So it, it helps with the diversification of our farms and and and, and how we, we manage our businesses as well. So yeah, thanks to Etienne. That's that's it from my side. Thank you. Great. Etienne, yeah, very interesting presentation. I've I've actually Got a lot of questions myself, but uh, watching the clock, we've got about 35 minutes left. Uh, so I want to get on with the program. If I see there are questions coming into the Q&A panel, please uh, keep your questions coming. There's some interesting stuff coming through, and uh, we'll certainly try and answer as many of those uh, as, as we can. Um, Johan, I'm just going to run my presentation quickly before we get to you. You're a little bit fast out of the blocks for me um and then we'll we'll get to your presentation so um on with the program uh i'm due on next just to give you a short overview of the trade forward uh, southern africa work that was done 
uh, not only for abalone, but across, uh, across the mussel and um, oyster sector as well. So today is the first of three webinars. Uh, next week's webinar will deal with, uh, with mussels. And then in the week after that, we will have a webinar on oysters. Now, these webinars today, next week, and the week after have been made possible by Trade Forward Southern Africa. You heard of SIM at the start. In this week's webinar, I'm briefly going to talk just around export necessity. Uh, there's no rocket science there. We know products uh, of high value have to be exported. Then next week, I'll do a little bit more of a look at the compliance roadmap that was developed by Trade Forward Southern Africa. And then in the third webinar, when we discuss oysters, I'm going to look around the recommendations, challenges and opportunities that were developed through the TFSA work and also at some secondary interventions uh, or secondary assistance that was provided by TFSA or Trade Forward Southern Africa. Essentially, the work that was done revolved around meeting of standards and regulations to access EU or European Union markets with Southern African aquaculture products. Now, I always get asked, well, if all of the abalone is being exported to the Far East, who's going to eat abalone in Europe? The fact of the matter is there's a growing diaspora of uh, Chinese and Japanese and Vietnamese people in Europe, uh, which regard abalone quite highly and uh, which do create a market in the EU as well. Um, for cultural reasons, the market for, for mussels and oysters in Europe is, is potentially greater than for abalone, uh, but this work certainly concentrated on all of the farmed uh, shellfish in uh, South Africa. The work uh, consisted of a broader package. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but there was work around uh, tilapia, uh, promoting the tilapia sector in Mozambique, and the work around shellfish um, spilt over into Namibia as well. Uh, Namibia also farms oysters, mussels, and to a lesser extent, abalone. And some of the export uh, work was done for Namibia uh, as well. So really, if we look at exports, exporting South African aquaculture products, um, as I say, nothing, no rocket science here. There's a necessity to do it. And this necessity is born out of the fact that the local market uh, is finite. Um, it's, it's only that big. Um, and for products like abalone, which do not have a strong cultural following in South Africa, the export market becomes essential. There's also changing the shifts in the market, changing market requirements uh, that drive the need for new export markets, such as Europe, as I've just explained. There's also a lot of international competition, as Tian has pointed out. And uh, if we are not competing in that market, um, we certainly do uh, our industry a disfavor. Um, we need to compete there, not only abroad, um, but we also need to compete locally so that exporters of shellfish that are farmed in other countries do not dominate our markets. And I think particularly of a product like mussels, where South Africa imports uh, quite a lot of mussels against the backdrop that we have a local mussel producing sector. And then I don't have to explain the limitations of a single point of offtake. Um, our abalone industry is quite dependent on, on a few offtake points in the Far East, and certainly diversification of those offtake points uh, creates uh, more opportunity and safety and security for the industry. There's lots of opportunities and lots of potential on the right hand side column. Um, the taste patterns of consumers change over time. Uh, modern palates all over the world are looking for new products. Um, I'm sure those of you that watch the video uh, will want to go and try abalone as a product. So certainly there's potential and opportunities uh, to see abalone and other farm shellfish go to other parts of the world. There are potentially increased returns from exporting uh, to, to markets abroad. Um, I say potentially because there are also high costs, logistical costs to get products abroad, abroad. And certainly if we have a greater market access, it does advantage local small and medium business and it creates a more inclusive industry 
so that that industry can collectively supply to the demand. And then lastly, it earns foreign currency. And for all African countries, earning foreign currency is, a, is certainly of primary importance. I've often used the slide, um, I go around the world saying that I think Aristotle was into aquaculture because uh, aquaculture takes a lot of thinking, not only the production side, uh, but certainly finding the right markets and making those markets work for the product. This uh, very complicated uh, diagram uh, was produced by Rabobank uh, a while ago. And I don't want to run through any of the data on, on this diagram. I just want to illustrate to you that this shows the flow of, of seafood across the world. And um, you can see in Europe at the top, there's a big pink arrow that represents the flow of salmon. Um, then the big blue arrow from uh, South America across to the Far East is also mainly salmon, but a lot of other products. And the important thing here to show is that South Africa does not feature on this, uh, this world map of seafood flows. There's a small arrow from Namibia, and certainly the volumes we hope in the future will increase to such an extent that South Africa starts featuring on this uh, flow of, of product. Interesting, you can see the rest of Africa uh, faces the same dilemma. We are very, very marginal participants in global seafood trade. So on with Aristotle, um, to create a sustainable export demand for abalone or other farmed shellfish, um, it's, it's, it's not as simple as just looking at what market price can be obtained abroad. There needs to be a careful consideration of cost-effective transport logistics. Um, we know where fuel costs and energy costs are going. Uh, certainly it creates a big carbon footprint to take abalone from South Africa to the Far East, and all of those aspects have to be considered. I've spoken briefly about competition and new competition. Um, it's, you saw from Tian's presentation that it's not as simple as entering the Chinese market and uh, expecting them to take up everything that can be produced. There is real competition with locally produced uh, products and with products from elsewhere in the world. We all understand the volume game. Um, markets abroad seldomly, uh, seldomly are interested in full, small volume buying. Uh, you know that there are wholesalers that take up these products in the international markets. And this volume game is uh, a game which the abalone industry has got right, but for small startup aquaculture industries, it's, it's really a challenge when they want to enter the international market. And then lastly, there's the cost of compliance to be able to serve these international markets. Um, there's no secret that uh, increasing barriers to trade are being put in place by many countries in the world. And those barriers of, of trade are not always to protect local production. Sometimes they are to safeguard food safety standards. Um, but regardless of what the underlying reasons are, these barriers of trade uh, create, uh, create stumbling blocks for, for local production. So around this background, the interventions that were made in the Trade Forward Southern Africa work was to come up with details and guidelines around what the compliance requirements for the European Union are. There was also a review done of the shellfish monitoring programs in South Africa and Namibia. And then there were two compliance roadmaps that were developed and circulated uh, into the industry and into other role players such as government. Um, these are the covers of, of these roadmaps that were developed around EU compliance. And in this first webinar, I'm not going to dig into any major content details, uh, the nuts and bolts of these compliance uh, frameworks or, or roadmaps uh, will be discussed in next week's webinar. I can just maybe give you a little taster. Um, the compliance to EU regulations for the export of shellfish from South Africa really rests on four pillars. There's a food safety pillar that uh, demands um, compliance in terms of, of the safety of the product for human consumption. There is a veterinary drug residue monitoring pillar uh, that looks at which uh, drugs are used and the residues of those drugs. There's aquatic animal health pillar 
that obviously looks at the aquatic animal health management procedures. And then lastly, these animals being farmed in the marine environment uh, means that there is a marine biotoxin and microbiological pillar, uh, particularly around mussels and oysters that we'll discuss in the coming weeks and not so much around abalone. So that's really uh, the story from my side in this first webinar around the work from TFSA. Um, I've repeated on several occasions that there's a webinar next week on mussels in which I'll unpack some of those roadmaps that were developed. And then in the week after that, we'll have a discussion on oysters and we'll continue to unpack this material. The webinar next week on mussels, if you want to register for it, uh, the QR code is there. You can literally pick up your smartphone, scan that code and it takes you to the registration page. Uh, there is a URL link as well. I have shared the link in the chat panel. I will share it again. So join us when we discuss uh, mussels next week. And then in the week after that, we'll be discussing oysters. And I will deal with more of the Trade Forward Southern African work. Again, if you've got a smartphone, you can scan that code. Um, I can also tell you that by tomorrow in your email, you will have the registration link. So if you miss it now, don't panic. You can uh, certainly get that link uh, in your email uh, tomorrow. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Just an uh, introduction to the work that was done by Trade Forward Southern Africa. Um, I do see there are still questions coming through. We have about, if I look at the clock, about 25 minutes left. Um, as important as the role is of government, and the work that Trade Forward Southern Africa has done and the work that Tian and his uh, team is doing at the Abalone Export Council. There is also the critically important work that is done by the Abalone Farmers Association of South Africa. Before I invite Johan to tell us a little bit about the association and their work, I do want to launch a short poll uh, just with a few questions. I think there's five or six questions that will come up onto your screen now. Um, most of these questions are multiple choice, so it will take you just a few minutes to complete or a minute or so. I think the second question uh, is a, uh, sorry, the third question, I think one of them is a multiple choice. Sorry, I'm not sure which one it is, but you'll see the poll that has come up onto your screen. Um, please complete that poll. Uh, this webinar has been made possible by TFSA and the results uh, of this poll are, are really important to inform their work going forward. It informs them where they can next uh, provide guidance and assistance to the sector. And uh, for that reason, I'm really encouraging you to answer the questions on that short poll. I'll leave that poll up for a little while. I'll also share the results of the poll at the end. Uh, while that is running, I'm going to invite Johan uh, into the stage. Johan Hakruit uh, does fantastic work in the background for the Abalone sector, and Johan is going to tell us a little bit more. Johan, it's over to you. You're welcome to share your screen. Thanks, Etienne. Uh, sorry for jumping in there. Um, I was hoping to, to evade uh, load shedding here, uh, which would have allowed me uh, a nice big screen to read from because the eyesight's not so great anymore. But but here we go. So so Afasa, uh, who are we? Uh, voluntary association, not for gain, a nonprofit organization registered under the Nonprofit Organizations Act, and consequently a body corporate with an existence separate from its members and office bearers. It is established to pursue the objectives and conduct, is in, conduct is its, its affairs in accordance with the constitution. Let me just see if I, let me just, yeah, this was now the um, load shedding. Let me just try again. Right. Okay, so, so we have a constitution. We have five duly elected council members, including a chairman, um, we have a CEO and a secretariat that uh, involves themselves with strategic and day-to-day -day management of the, the association, accountant for mon monthly financials, and we, um, we actually do an annual audit as well. 
So these are our members. Um, we've got 12, 12 members. Uh, some of them have more than one farm, so that, that this won't tally to 12. But, but there they are. I'm not going to run through them. Uh, collectively, these farms have a capacity of about 3,000 tons, um, selling annually into the market about 2,500 tons. Uh, total employment of 1,500, and then a turnover of uh, plus minus 1.4 billion rand. Uh, uh, just incidentally, I just want to look onto what Tian said. Is so, so those 3,000 tons are, are, are matched by poached abalone um, from the wild, and then, and it is something that does concern uh, every all the stakeholders in in the sector. So just a quick one. There we are. So on the on the um, top right, uh, between Honda Club Bay and Alexandria Bay, we've got some uh, ranching areas. Uh, this is where the the abalone is actually farmed in the sea and off not off land. Although there is one operation there that uh, that farms on land. Uh, we've got some farms here on the on the west coast uh, and Durang Bay, and then we've got. Uh, quite a number, the majority of, of volume in volume actually sits here in the southwest coast. And then we've got uh, one lone rider out to the east there, um, Richard Cox, the owner and CEO, uh, company's called Wild Coast Avalone. And then he's also got a small ranching area there in the Port Elizabeth area. So the objectives. Um, really is to establish communication and cooperation amongst the members of the association to assist the regulatory bodies with industry compliance to laws, regulations, and monitoring programs, consult with the regulatory bodies on changes to the regulatory framework, uh, communicate national and international compliance requirements with the industry. We serve as a platform for market discussions according to the conditions of the Competition Commission exemption. Uh, we represent the industry uh, on various forums, both public and private. Um, we assume membership of related associations. Um, and then we also try to procure funds and apply fu such funds for the furtherance of the stated objectives. And I can just mention here yeah, at this point, always quickly, I just want to um, thank Sim and, and, and his colleagues for, for, for helping us to, to map um, the, the, the roadmap to establish a roadmap for, for EU compliance. We're all very excited. We've got a couple of hurdles that we that we need to cross, but we, we we're confident that we ultimately gonna break into the into the European and the UK market. I want to specifically mention the UK market because I know much of the funding also comes from the UK. Um, so yeah, and then and then we've also got um, some funding that was um, provided for some some research from Innovate UK. So yeah, we, we, we certainly are grateful for the contributions. We hope that we can deliver the goods in, in the near future. Um, I'm confident um, we have uh, a well-oiled uh, industry and, and we have um, people that um, occupy positions in the, in the regulatory bodies that are hardworking and certainly are, are helping us to, to, to break those barriers that, that um, is facing us specifically with regards to compliance and regulations. So then just a quick one. Uh, currently, our, our regulatory framework um, is, is, is guided by the Marine Living Resources Act. From the Marine Living Resources Act um, flows regulations. And then out of the regulations, um, we have established um, the, South, uh, the South African Selfish Monitoring and Control Program. And um, in the control program, uh, the control program is enforced through, through permit conditions. And so in total, um, yeah, quite a complex and comprehensive regulatory framework um, that takes quite a bit to comply to but I think we're not doing too badly. And then um, just on top of that, um, there's a number of other um, acts that come into play and regulations that come into play. There's some environmental acts, 
number of them. There's the Animal Disease Act. There's the Fertilizers, Farm Feeds, Agricultural Remedies and Stock Remedies Act. There's the Medicines and Related Substance Act, National Health Act, Foodstuff, Cosmetics and Disinfectant Act, and the National Regulator for Compliance Specifications Act. So yeah, uh, a mouthful if you, if you want to engage um, and be compliant in all those four, the, those four pillars that Etienne uh, referred to, food safety, uh, veterinary um, uh, residues, um, animal health, um, and then the, the, the marine biotoxins and, and E. coli, uh, uh, microbiologicals. So yeah, that, that's on the, on the regulatory side. And then also just, um, yeah, because there's, 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 there's huge um, pressure um, on, on this industry to, to comply, to, to succeed in exporting to the EU, um, the industry, the sector, uh, together with the regulators, are in the process of developing an Agriculture Development Act. Um, we were hoping to, to get it through Parliament this year. It seems unlikely. But in that act, we really, I think we are covering all the bases and we're going to make sure that we will be ultimately EU compliant um, so that we can enter those markets, uh, be it just to to, to service the, 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 the Chinese and the other Eastern cultures there, I'm sure it's going to rub off uh, to the rest of, of the Euro, to the rest of Europeans and, and also to the, to the EU, uh, to the UK. Um, Etienne, that's, that, that's me. Thanks. Great, uh, Johan, thank you for that presentation. Uh, interesting dynamic. You know, I was, I was listening to you at the end and, and you're saying it, you hope it rubs off to to other communities in, in Europe. Um, I hope there's not many French people on, online, but I've seen those French people eat stuff a lot funnier than abalone. So I'm 100% sure there's a market in Europe. Uh, Johan, thanks for that. Um, interesting insights. Um, I see we have about 15 minutes left. Um, many of the questions have been answered online by my fellow panel members. Um, I see here's one question from Senior. Senior asking, uh, are there any non-tariff barriers for the Far East? Um, Senior, I'm going to give you my opinion, and I'm happy to take one of the other panel members if they want to comment, maybe Tian. So, <clears throat> Senior, we used to, in the past, see the Far East as, as a market with very little uh, non-tariff barriers, but that's changing. Um, so even the Far Eastern markets are increasingly putting non-tariff barriers in place, um, both as a protection of their own industry and also to, um, to advance their own industry and their own products. Uh, so that's my opinion. I think non-tariff barriers will, will play an increasing part in all world markets. And uh, maybe Tian, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you're definitely right by, by, by saying that. So, so in our Eastern markets, it's only China that has uh, tariff barriers uh, for South African product. But Hong, Hong Kong and Macau, which is uh, uh, basically, um, what's, what's the word, zones of, of China, they don't have, they free trade, trade zones, so, so no, no barriers there. Uh, no barriers in Singapore, Malaysia, um the relationship that South Africa has with America well, through the Alcoa agreement, I think, also no import duties. So basically the the the, the one that we have um that stands out is is uh, duties on our product into mainland China. And you know it could be for various reasons uh, protecting their own own product because they're quite a big producer themselves. Uh, but interestingly somebody like Australia would not have any barriers uh, for their abalone into um, uh, uh, China, mainland China. Uh, so, so it is possible, you know, to obviously get, get free trade uh, going, you know, on a, on a political level. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Tian. Um, we've all known that these webinars, that there's always a gremlin somewhere. There's always something that goes wrong somewhere. Um, and I can tell you what went wrong in this webinar is for some reason, the incorrect poll uh, was launched. 
Um, but that doesn't matter. The questions are quite generic. Uh, my apologies. It actually says at the top of the um, of the poll, it says Aquatrans webinar three. Um, but the questions are still valuable. The answers are still valuable. I see we've got an 83% participation rate in the poll. So if you haven't yet answered those three or four questions, please do so. Let's see if we can get that up to a 90% response rate. Um, and then as soon as we hit 90, I'll share the results, uh, the results of that poll. Um, then a couple of other questions that came through. Uh, you're welcome to go and have a look at them. There was one question on how people can visit Abalone Farms. Uh, Sarah answered that for us. Uh, I think, Sarah, you mentioned a, a company that can be contacted uh, to arrange visits to Abalone Farms. Uh, these Abalone Farms are mainly Western Cape based, like uh, Johan explained. Then there was a question around where the data, Tian, where you got your data from. Um, that has been answered online as well. And I do know that Trade Forward Southern Africa has a very extensive uh, data access trade, international trade data access uh, platform. We've actually had one of their people in a previous meeting with us. I might see if we can get them online again. Um, Sim, do you want to comment on that? Maybe you can just give us one sentence around the trade statistics that uh, TFSA have available. Sim, can you comment on that? Hi, Echep. Well, yes, I currently do not have them handy with me, but what I could possibly do, because I've got all those details here, we could get, get my team, my colleagues, to actually share that kind of information with you. My apologies for okay. that. But no again, problem, I, I think what's also important is that uh, on our on our TFSA Southern Africa.org website, we actually have our, our tools there that are sitting there that can actually help with some of this information. So if people have time, you can just go through there and just play around with, uh, with those tools. You could actually be able to pick up quite a lot of information in terms of your most attractive markets and whatever you, you need to do as an exporter. So I'd really urge people to go there, but I'll get my team as well to just come back and get feedback on the on that particular question. I took note of it. Excellent. Thank you, Sim. We'll try and get uh, somebody to just give us more data in next week's, uh, next week's webinar as well. There was a question around feeding, which uh, Sarah has answered online. Thank you, Sarah, um, around the feeding of abalone. There was also a question around whether abalone is only a food product. Uh, that was answered online. Um, if I can try and get to the last questions. Uh, there was a question from Blessing on poaching. That has been answered. Um, then there were questions around the presentation slides. The links to that will be shared in your email tomorrow. And then uh, Veronica Alphonse is asking, are the, are the feed products produced in South Africa? So abalone feed, I wonder who I can hand this to. Um, Sarah, can I maybe come to you? Abalone feed, is it produced in South Africa, Sarah? Hi, Etienne. Yeah, there are two feed companies uh, in South Africa, Mary Feed and Specialized Aquatic Feed, or SAP. And they both produce. Right, thank, thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, we are 86% on the poll, so thank you for those of you that have answered the questions. I'm uh, closing the poll now, and I will share the results with you. You can have a look at it uh, on your screen while we close off this webinar. We've got another few minutes left, and in these last two or three minutes, I want to do the following. I'm going to ask each one of the panel members to just make a final comment. Um, around the abalone industry and perhaps on their views on the way forward. And then I will be sharing the email addresses of all of the panel members as we close down. For final comments and closing, maybe let's start. Tian, can we start with you? Just your final comments before we go. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Etienne. You know, I, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think. As an industry, we still have a lot to do and um, in marketing our product and protecting the, the, the provenance, the, the value of our product uh, across the world. We've got such a great product and uh, that will require more collaboration uh, between the industry players. You know, um, I think that's, that's my, 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 my parting shot, you know, so 
so yeah thanks you know uh, and and then if we do that i think you know developing new markets uh is going to be so much easier if we maintain uh that premier status product uh, uh of, 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 of of us uh, you know and um i know there's a lot of competition and competition from different countries and, and species uh but we've really got a good product going here the market tells us that so so yeah um, i'm quite positive if we sort that out the, the sky's the limit thank you excellent nice encouraging words to close off there tian uh next up final comments sarah just your final parting shot uh, I, I think I'm a little bit biased here because I've probably got the most exciting job out of everyone. Uh, I've been in research. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of exciting things that can still happen in the abalone sector. And, and like I mentioned in the presentation, there's a lot of room for growth. And as Tian says, we do have a great product. Um, we've got a, a sustainable product. And um, yeah, it's exciting to see where it's going to go. Excellent. Great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, Johan, your final word of, of, uh, of wisdom for us. Thanks, Etienne. Thanks for arranging this again. Yeah, just on the on the compliance side, you know, it, it certainly, you know, we've got we've got brilliant farms. You know that that that's an understatement. Well oiled machines. Um, we've 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 got a regulatory infrastructure that is um, certainly uh, positioning itself itself to to allow us to to gain access to other markets and 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 yeah the call is just that we we work together um as a country all the stakeholders um and 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 exploit the opportunities you know we've got we've got challenges we've got geopolitical challenges we've got challenges at home politically uh we've got an electricity crisis um but you know even with all of that um i i, I remain positive and and I'm sure that we are going to yeah when 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 we have this session again in two to three years time, uh, we'll we'll see some progress. Thanks. Excellent, uh, Johan, for those last words. Andrea, um, you've been sitting quietly uh, since the opening. Uh, your final words uh, for before we go. This is just proof, Etienne, that government officials do sit in the office past <laughs> four o'clock. Um, <laughs> no, I think just to, uh, Johan took the words out of my mouth. Um, you know, if we're trying to grow a sector, everyone has their roles and responsibilities, but if we're not uh, collaborating around that, um, you know, we're not going to move forward. So um, that's a key thing. And maybe just a plug in on the feed question. Um, because there was a question around feed as well. Uh, we are also part of an exciting project that is looking at farming kelp, which is also funded by UK aid through um, the FCDO. Um, so there is a lot of exciting developments and obviously kelp is a very important feed aspect around abalone farm and um, you know securing production going forward. So thank you, Etienne, um, thank you, T uh, TFSA. Um, for your support as well, and then um, obviously the farmers for the collaboration that we've got going on. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. Um, this webinar was made possible by, by TFSA. Uh, Sim, um, you've got the honor to give us a last parting shot. Uh, and thank you from my side, uh, Sim, that you guys made this possible. Sim, your last words. Thank you very much, uh, Etienne. Uh, look, I really appreciate you giving me a chance to speak. I think after all this uh, spoken about the, the sector, it's really, it's a disservice that I speak last, but uh, I really want to thank you, uh, Etienne, uh, as uh, as our partner that we worked with as GFSA. Uh, thank you, my fellow panelists, Andrea, Johan, Sarah. Thank you so much for the for the expert uh, conversations we've had in, in this, in this uh, webinar today. I think as TFA say, really, our, our big, big uh, win here is the collaborative, collaborative effort that we're seeing amongst uh, players in the sector. And for us, it's, it's a big win. The whole idea really is to increase exports, alleviate poverty in our region. And especially, as we say, we really deliberate about helping out women. We do have activities that going forward uh, for the next extended year, where we'll be looking to really help uh, women-owned, women-managed uh, organizations to, to access exports. So we're really looking forward to these collaborations. And again, 
thank you to the, uh, all the participants. Uh, I, I think the interactions are great. It does show that the sector is growing and it's going to be feeding us in the future. So thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Etienne. Excellent. Thank you, Sim. We are on time. Um, we don't like running these webinars for more than 90 minutes. Uh, good afternoon to you from Aquaculture Africa magazine. We will soon be known as Aquaculture Africa Media. Uh, please join us in the Muscle webinar next week. Look out in your email for the link to register for that. And we'll be talking oysters in the week after that. To my fellow panel members, thank you. It's been fun having you on this afternoon. Thank you to everybody that has joined us. I will leave these email addresses on for a little while if you want to jot them down and uh, enjoy the rest of your day where you are. We hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.